Jake Scruggs, and I'm going to give a talk today about uh, there is such a thing as too much testing, which is a sort of reflection of some uh, hard fought and won lessons I've had over the course of my lifespan as a consultant and software developer, developer uh, integrating some sort of automated testing on a lot of different projects. If you notice that everything has kind of been shifted up, I took Yehuda's advice and uh, moved all my slides up a bit so that you can read the stuff. Um, so first we have to go through the little who am I stuff. Uh, I used to be a high school physics teacher, uh, which was a lot of fun until I got tired of writing bathroom passes. And uh, I taught myself Java. I apprenticed at Object Mentor, which was a really interesting thing to do right after you had just learned what an object is, to hang out with a bunch of people who like spend their whole lives thinking about objects. Um, I worked at ThoughtWorks. I did about four years there. I wrote Metric Foo, which maybe some of you use. And uh, now I'm a consultant at Optiva. And um, the genesis of this talk was uh, I was starting yet another uh, project from scratch. And we were spending a lot of time arguing uh, about uh, shoulda versus rspec. And some of the team really wanted to use shoulda, and some of the team really wanted to use rspec. Um, but what we weren't doing is having a conversation about like what our testing strategy should be. And this is kind of a pretty common thing, is that people sort of, nobody has a conversation about testing, right, uh, anymore. A lot of times it's just sort of assumed, well, we're going to test, and then there's just a strategy sort of adopted, and then that strategy just gets implemented, and maybe it's the wrong strategy for your project, you know? Because what you tend to do is just sort of use the same strategy you used on your last project, which is, you know, you know yesterday's weather is a pretty good thing, unless you happen to be doing a, uh, you know, moving to Antarctica between days. Um, so uh, this is going to start off with like a tour where I'm going to go through all the projects I've been on and talk about uh, what uh, mistakes I've made and what we did. And uh, don't worry, it's not just stories. We're going to be kind of getting some patterns and then we're going to like uh, extract those patterns and discuss them. So to start off, the tour. Uh, so after uh, kind of talking my way into becoming a paid consultant with little to no education, uh, I got put on the dealer portal, which was my first ThoughtWorks project. And it was a pretty cool project. Uh, this was a large uh, manufacturer of tractors uh, that uh, you may know. And what they had is they had a whole bunch of websites where what they want, they uh, could, dealers could go there and they could do really cool things like submit a sample of the engine oil of a tractor and then go to the website and find out like diagnosis stuff on the tractor. And there was a million of those like sites that did a million different things and they wanted a portal that would integrate all these things. And so since it was a portal, we were gonna use portal software and Java and WebSphere and of course Struts because this is about five years ago and Struts was uh, pretty popular. Um, so. Uh, there was about 80 to 85 percent coverage, which if you've been in the Java world is a pretty good amount of coverage. Um, it's hard to get in all the nooks and crannies of Java. Uh, WebUnit was something that was big on this project. And WebUnit, I don't know if you've ever used it, is a way of simulating clicking through the, uh, the browser without actually having a browser. It's kind of like a Rails integration test. And because it was really easy to write these tests and you got a lot of coverage out of it, they were everywhere, but that led to sort of a, a crazy amount of build time. This was a, a relatively small project with six developers, and it had a 20-minute build. We were about four or five months into the project, right? So extrapolating that out, you know, like how long is it going to be after a year or two? You know, like it uh, was already kind of a daunting build. Um, the other big problem was that WebSphere took uh, five minutes just to start up, right? So you want to kick off your test suite, it's just kind of waiting around for five minutes while WebSphere sort of does whatever it does. Um, and these are on pretty powerful machines. Uh, so it was an interesting project in that there was sort of this heavy burden of testing. And definitely, if you broke the build near the end of the day, and we had this red flashing light that would sort of go, and it would drive everybody nuts uh, when you broke the build, you had a minimum of 20 minutes before you could fix that, right? Because even if you just went, oh, I left off a semicolon and you just check it right back in right there, uh, you had to wait a little bit. Uh, but the, the team was definitely into it. The team was a, a supportive team. The team was uh, into testing and the management was uh, definitely down with the idea of testing software. So we didn't really have a bunch of pushback and everybody sort of chipped in and made it uh, more bearable. Uh, so that was a long build, but it was, it was supportive. So moving on, 
I got put on from a very small team to a very large, large project. I think it was something like 800,000 lines of JavaScript when I joined. And it had been running for about seven years, maybe eight years. And it was the huge financing app. And this is, uh, you know, basically if you want to buy a large uh, tractor, yet again, um, you basically take out a mortgage. And that mortgage has to be managed through something. And so this application managed all that for people who would sell you the mortgages, right? You would go to the dealer and say, I want to buy this thing, but you didn't have $600,000 in your pocket. So you would essentially like take out a large loan. Um, so this was like, at one point, it was uh, proudly proclaimed that it was the largest Java app you know, in existence, like, which was kind of a dumb thing to, to be proud of. But uh, <laughs> they, it was. And uh, it used EJB 1.0, uh, so that's Entity Beans and all that. It used Struts 1.0 on 10% of the app because they wrote their own way to get around pages before Struts. And then they thought, wow, Struts is cool, so we'll integrate that. Uh, but that didn't work so well, so they stopped and never backed it out. So you'd be in this app like working on a bug and you'd be like, this page is crazy. It doesn't work like anything else in the app because that was the 10% that was a struts app. And then you'd go, oh, let's go dig through some XML and then you'd figure it out. Uh, so when I got on, I was like the first person I think ever to run a coverage on it and it was like 21% test coverage. Uh, four years later, they hit 25%. And the problem with this uh, thing is that it's a large application that once had like, you know, 20 developers on it and was very active. And now it's kind of like five, six developers. And it's sort of in maintenance mode, right? They're not really doing anything major. So they're just never going to get to all that code. They're sort of fixing and testing the code that they can get there. But when I joined, it was actually kind of a test hostile world where you couldn't write tests because the EJBs demanded so much just to instantiate an object. It's just like, I just want a freaking object, right? And it would be like, no, no, you have to be connected to some server or something. And you'd be like, oh, I have no idea. So it actually kind of beat the testing out of me. It was, it was kind of brutal. Uh, we had a Silk Suite, uh, which is like Mercurial or Selenium or whatever. It's a click through the app thing. And that, that ran like eight computers 36 hours straight. And 80% of the tests would fail. But <laughs> never the same 80%. Because I kept saying, well, why don't we just cut out the tests that fail all the time? And they were like, oh, no, <laughs> not the same tests. And so we didn't really know what we were running it for. And I kept asking a lot of like, really uncomfortable questions. And I basically figured out at some point like, it just made the company feel better to run these tests. So they had like, a guy who had to sit in a room with like, eight computers, and it was noisy. And he had to like, run those tests. And then he would come to the stand-ups and say things like, well, I don't, I don't know, 20% passed. And they'd be like, all right. So um, it was kind of the worst of both worlds. Like we had not really much coverage, and we it was money, right? Like this is like millions of dollars, possibly hundreds of millions of dollars passed through this thing. Uh, if we screwed it up, in theory, this is you know bad, right? Um, and uh, it also had a 20-minute build, so there was good times. Uh, so after that, um, or actually sort of during that, I kind of got frustrated with Java and taught myself Ruby. And one of the great things about ThoughtWorks is I just sort of said, hey, guys, I'm, I'm a Ruby developer now. And they went, well, all right, cool. And so uh, I had sort of been learning on my own. And I'd been running the Ruby users group. And they uh, put me on a small little uh, Ruby project uh, of the large managed hosting company. Um, and the really cool thing about this is that uh, you, when you manage stuff, Man you do managed hosting, you have to manage all this IP space. And it's all binary, weird calculations. So it was a lot of fun to be in this domain, right? Because you get to do binary math. And there's all these problems you have to solve, like, hey, do we have any space left? Because it's not obvious if you have any space left in IP space. And also, somebody wants a big chunk of numbers that are right next to each other. Can we do that? And where is that chunk? And if you're running out of space, you have to be able to prove to the governance bodies that you are indeed running out of space. So this was the whole idea of this app. And it was a cool app in a many, many ways. Uh, first of all, it was, a, it was a Ruby on Rails app. But also, uh, we had near 100% coverage, which was like sort of a new thing. And um, we sat maybe like where those doors were was where the, like, one of the founders of the, the company sat. And at any point, we could walk over there and say, like, hey, man, like, you, know, you want to see something? And he'd go, sure. And we'd show him something, and then he would go, Oh, I was really thinking about this or that or the other thing. So 
We had a really fast suite. Um, it was a cool little nine-week project, and uh, it sort of had the proper level of testing. We got it out the door, and, but the testing enabled us to occasionally just go in and rip out a bunch of code and like change things when, obviously, uh, requirements change. So that was kind of a success, and that was fun. And then I moved on to the small social startup, which was a Ruby on Rails RSpec uh, project. Um, so this is back very early in RSpec's career. I was an early adopter, because I know this Chalinski guy. And he kept talking about BDD, and I didn't really know what that was, but RSpec seemed kind of cool. So um, we had 100% coverage. Uh, we had a really cool Selenium uh, build that would kick off when we checked in, and it would run all these tests and make sure everything worked. Um, it was one pair. So it was me and this other guy, a friend of mine, uh, and luckily we got along because it was just the same guy every day for three months. And we had all come, and then there was like a, a project manager, and we had all come from like super heavy projects where it just had to run. So we had used yesterday's weather when deciding how to test this app, right? We just said like, Okay, well, you know, on my you know previous apps that everything needed to run, there was no way you could afford to fail. So we're going to do Selenium. We're going to do 100% coverage. We did really extensive view testing in our spec, which seemed like a really cool idea at the time, um, but was actually very brittle. So um, one of the weird things about it, though, is it was just this tiny little startup that they wanted to get out the door and see if it made any money at all. So the whole point of this thing was like. This guy had like kind of a crazy idea, and he was just thinking, well, I, I want to write this site, but uh, I need some help. So they brought in the consultants, and we were going to build this thing, and they just wanted to get it out there and see if anybody cared at all. And if so, let's make it something really cool. And if not, then maybe it just goes away. Um, but that was not what we did, right? We wrote this sort of bulletproof app that like was crazy well tested. Which is, you know, good if you were like, you know, trying to do money transactions. Not so great if you're trying to do a quick startup and and see if like there's any uh, use to this thing at all or interest. So this is like, you know, the first sort of like big failure uh, that uh, happened, and Obi just made fun of me for it uh, when uh, right before. Where are you? There he is. Uh, I don't know if you're here right before it. Um, so uh, yeah, a lot of lessons learned on that project. Um, so yeah. After this, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll summarize all this later on, so just hang on. We've got a couple more projects to go. Um, so after this, I move on to sort of the opposite project, right? It's like, in theory, they're both social networking sort of sites, but one was like tiny little startup and let's just get it out the door. And then the other one was like huge company that wants to get into sort of the where to go, what to do website business across the nation. By the way, uh, coming soon to San Francisco. Anyway. Um, and so we built this app for them. It was a rewrite of a Java app that had, listed, that had lived in one city for like 10 years. And uh, they wanted to make it live in like 37 cities. Uh, so we took the 10-year-old Java app and rewrote it in ten, uh, six months with 10 developers in Ruby on Rails. Uh, there was a couple of mistakes really early on before anybody ever showed up. And one of the biggest ones, and uh, please learn this lesson, is if you write a spike, to figure out if you can use a new thing, right? You're going, oh, maybe I'm going to use Django. We'll just hack on Django for a month and see if we can get anything to work. And then you're really happy with the output. Do not, under any circumstances, just go, OK, cool. Let's just check that in and then start building on top of that. Because it's a bunch of junk, right? You wrote it as fast as possible with zero testing. And like they even let the manager write a bunch of code, which was just, just terrible code. And um, so basically, we started off, we had like a couple of thousand lines of code and zero coverage and no real knowledge, actually, of what it even did, right? So we would play a story. You would start working on a story, and then you'd find out that it actually already did that, but in a very weird way somewhere over here. So you'd go over there and try and figure out what's going on. Um, they wouldn't let us pair, so that was fun. Um, so like 50% of the team, the consultants part, um, I was working for ThoughtWorks at the time, we wrote tests. And then the other 50% either wrote no tests or really kind of bad, like I'm just new to testing sort of tests. And that was kind of intense because it developed this very us versus them sort of philosophy. And you probably experienced this before, I would guess. Like maybe you've been on a team where you're the testing zealot or you've had a testing zealot and he kind of drags everybody into the testing sphere, right? 
But then everybody else is kind of like, oh man, like I wrote all this code and it works and now I gotta like write some tests, which is of course wrong, you should have wrote the test first. But um, they would see this, the test as sort of an impediment. Or they would do this major refactoring and it would break a bunch of tests because they were brittle tests. And so they would learn this sort of like lesson that like tests really slow you down. And it was this, you know, sort of a, a very strange thing because it was sort of a dictated level of testing. Um, so there was a lot of backlash. Um, but it was all very subversive and nobody would ever say anything. So you'd go like, hey, you like testing, right? And they'd go, yeah, sure. But then you'd see like his next check-in would have like 20 changed source files but no changed tests. And you go, like, he doesn't care about testing. Um, no offense. So um, it was a weird thing because we had sort of too much testing from the team's point of view. But also, it really wasn't a very good amount of coverage. Right, like we didn't really have confidence to go in there and just throw things around. We had some very big problems with the project, but we didn't have the confidence to change them. Uh, after that, I moved on to the VoIP signup app. So large uh, voice over IP pro provider uh, needs to have a signup app. And what they do is they hire us to come in and we're gonna write this thing for them. And it's like you think, oh, it's just a wizard. It collects your name and your phone number and it collects a whole bunch of things and then it just hooks you, you know, sends you off a box in the mail. But I didn't realize like how crazy important this thing is because in the VoIP world, there's a crazy amount of churn. So like maybe they'll get 30,000 customers a week, but they'll also lose 20,000. So the 30,000 has to keep coming in. The sign up site must always work. If it doesn't work, then they're still gonna keep losing customers, right? And then they're gonna like be in a very, very bad position. So this was like a, re uh, a really high level of assurance was needed to keep this thing up and running. But we had this just sort of crazy team, one of those crazy teams you get on and you look around at everybody and you go like, that guy's smarter than me. That guy's smarter than me. That, wait a second. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, everybody here is just like kind of like crazy uh, good level. So. We had uh, Ruby on Rails and Dust. With Dust is sort of an RSpec-like uh, thing that was popular at the time, and also the guy who wrote it was on the project. Um, and we had near 100% coverage. We touched no databases, no, uh, no outside things, so we ran all our tests in something like 10 seconds, which was pretty awesome. Um, we also had this cool integration thing that would run as Rails integration tests locally, but when you checked it in, the cruise control server would then run them as real Selenium tests, right? So they kind of did double duty. It was kind of a neat sort of DSLE type approach. And um, then we could actually run the, D the Selenium tests in Firefox and Internet Explorer, which would drive out a lot of weird bugs that of course, since we're developers and we all use Firefox or Safari, we would not see. Um, and we caught those things really early, which was pretty awesome. We had like 10 different builds. Like we would literally have the Firefox build, the Selenium build, the quick unit test build. We had a build that migrated up the database and migrated back down and then did some checks to make sure it really did migrate the right way. And then there's like, what is that's four? There's six other ones I couldn't remember. I think there was like tests of the old version, tests of the new version, and just a lot of really cool things. Um, it was a very advanced testing suite, but it's a very advanced team. So a lot of times like this Selenium suite would go down and I have some weird problems but we would just like throw some developers at it and beat it until it like came back and we figured it out. So in looking back on this sort of app, I think this is like any other team I've ever been on, this would have been way too much testing. This just wouldn't have worked out. The team would have rebelled, management would have rebelled, and uh, you know, the code would have suffered because we would have spent all this time sort of babysitting this code, this, app, this testing suite that nobody cared about. But this team, and this project just sort of demanded this and could support it. So we were able to actually kind of uh, have like ridiculously well tested code where at some point they actually introduced in like, hey, you know, like there's this one path through the app and now there's gonna be two paths because there's gonna be a mobile offering and the other one. And we were able to like rip out like just huge chunks of code and put it back in and have almost zero bugs because we had it really well tested and we knew what was going on. So. Social Behemoth Part Two. So I quit ThoughtWorks, and then I get hired back onto this Social Behemoth, which is kind of weird. So I'm back as a different contractor, but, but still working on the project. And things have sort of uh, changed. Like there's sort of a, a bunch of new people on the project. They're up to around 60 or 70% coverage. 
They've had three separate attempts to add selenium, which have all failed. Um, yeah, we'll talk more about that in a bit. But um, yeah, so like they had hired like a, a bunch of contractors to come in and add selenium. They had hired like a one person whose job it was. They'd also at some point hired Jason Huggins to put in selenium, but then he quit and went to Google, so that didn't work so well. Um, he now actually works for Sauce Labs, which I think I'm going to mention a little bit later. Uh, but um, so it was more, the team was more test friendly, but we just had all this technical debt, right? We had these controllers that were like 600 lines long, like not just the controller, but like one method was like really long. And it was just a big like, hey, are you uh, something? Well, then do this. Uh, is uh, something? Well, then do this. It was like this switching on type thing, which is like textbook refactoring, right? Like you're switching on type. What are you doing? Um, so it was like kind of intense for the developers, right? Because they realized they had all this sort of gook to overcome that sort of happened because the, the original stuff had been written really fast and uh, hadn't you know, been sort of well uh, designed. So it was kind of coming along. It was kind of getting there when I left this project. Um, you know. Then I got to work on like a, this, a tiny little startup. It was this, just this little inkling in someone's mind. You know, This guy he had a crazy idea and he had a little bit of his life savings and he was going to hand it to some consultants and this probably should sound kind of familiar to you at this point. And having learned the lessons from before, I got to sort of apply them here. I walked into this thing as the tech lead and went, okay, we're going to do this link building app, which the idea behind link building is, say you sell shoes online, right? And you want people when they type in shoes into Google to come to your site. But how do you get that, right? Well, there's a lot of really evil ways to get Google search rankings. But there's also a very good way. And the way is you figure out what sites link to your competitors but not you. And then you write a really nice email to the site that links to your competitors, not you, saying, hey, I noticed you have a roundup of all the people who sell shoes. I sell shoes. Would you like to check out my site and link to me? And that works. I mean, it's really polite and nice, but it will build up your links. And people generally who compile these uh, lists are very nice people. A lot of times they're librarians and they take their work very seriously. And Google ranks them very high. So you can just sort of slowly, step by step, build your sort of search engine uh, you know, your Google juice. Um, but you got to manage all that. And the way they were managing it, that this guy was managing it right now, is with these huge Excel sheets, right? That would have all these like URLs, like crazy URLs. And they had this Perl script that would generate the people that link to your competitors, but not you. And then they would have little notes like, contacted on 1213, said maybe. And uh, so we wrote this app that would manage all that to you, for you. And it would also go out and find the people who link to your competitors, but not you. And then later it would check back periodically to see if they had linked back to you but never sent you an email. So it was a cool site. It had to take credit cards. It had to get out in three months. And it was only two people. So we made some decisions that we're just not going to really have an, a super advanced testing suite. Um, we're going to basically contest uh, controllers, models, and helpers. We're not going to test views. We're not going to do Selenium. Um, now, this being said, I still probably had like a 2.7 to 1 ratio of code to test. Or wait, did I say that wrong? Test to code. Um, I still tried to test pass through the methods, right? So if I had a method that had four pass through it, I would write four pretty quick tests for it, right? And that sort of bloats your average of uh, your ratio of test to code. But it was able, since they were all unit tests and I didn't hit the database, they all ran in under like 10 seconds, which was awesome, right? So it was a very low burdensome suite, even though it was actually a pretty comprehensive suite. And the cool thing about this project is that this sort of let us get out the door with enough assurance that it was going to work, but also quickly so that they could figure out if this thing was going to make money or do well. And it still exists, and it's doing all right, you know, like most startups. Um, it didn't set the world on fire like the guy thought he was going to do, but it's pretty cool. So check it out, by the way. That's the uh, URL. Um, so verdict, right for the project. All right, last project, project I'm on right now, Social Behemoth Part 3. So I left the Social Behemoth. I went to work on Squid and did some other things, and then they hired me back. Um, so they're now actually writing a new offering, which they're going to launch in like 27 more cities, by the way, coming to San Francisco sometime soon. Um, so the idea behind this new app was to 
kind of have a much more, like the old app required an army of dudes to generate content, and the new app is gonna be much more generated by users. Um, so we actually started writing a new Rails app, but it talks to the old app through Active Resource in various ways. Um, but that's a little bit of detail behind the scenes. Um, so a new product, uh, we had to sort of develop a testing structure for this, but now we sort of had the advantage of like having a lot of lessons learned from before. Um, so we have above 90% coverage. Uh, we have a metrics build because I'm, you know, Mr. Metrics guy, and that's kind of really helped out a lot. Uh, when I gave this talk about a couple months ago at Lone Star, I was talking about, yeah, we have like a low-level Selenium suite that just sort of hits the important stuff, and it's okay. And we've since ditched it. Um, I gotta say, I have integrated Selenium on a many a site, and it's rough because I feel like WebRat and all these other things out there make it really easy to get started with it, right? Within maybe a couple hours, you can be up and running, popping up a Firefox, clicking through the app, and you think, well, this is cool, this isn't so bad. But when you sort of like get it into your cruise control and you start failing the build on it, you can get into a really bad situation where this build fails pretty randomly, right? Because your box isn't powerful enough and it times out or just weird things happen when you try to run this, you know, on a Linux server somewhere that is underpowered. Um, so uh, the JavaScript testing has actually been a kind of a boon to us. It's a very Web 2.0-y type app and it has a lot of JavaScript. So we use uh, Blue Ridge to uh, do a lot of JavaScript testing so we can test first our JavaScript, which is nice. Um, so this is sort of a medium level of assurance, right? It needs to work, but if it doesn't work, it's not like uh, the world ends. So this is kind of a good enough level of testing. Um, yes, moving on. So let's start thinking about lessons learned here. Um, so there's three axes to my lessons learned. So we'll start with the first one. What's the right level from the code's point of view? And this is a question that really doesn't get asked often enough, right? Like, People sort of develop a testing strategy and they don't really focus on the fact that testing is supposed to be about design, right? So, I mean, does, does, do you feel like the tests that you have right now are encouraging good design? Does it feel like when you're writing the tests and you have to, you know, do something that's ugly, that means that there's ugliness in the code? Because that's kind of the idea, right? Like, the idea is that when you sort of feel like oh man, I have to put like 10 mocks in here just to call this controller. Maybe this controller's doing too much, right? And then you start pushing stuff down into the model. That's sort of like a thing that you need to kind of periodically go back and circle back and say like, is our testing strategy really helping our code? But also like, you know, there's also the bug idea, right? Like how often was our Selenium test catching bugs? And at some point we realized, well it isn't. Like we just, it fails and then we spend like a half a day like fixing it, which was a shame, right? Because, I mean, in some ways it was a really cool integration level test, but it really wasn't catching that many bugs. We also already had a QA team who would hammer on it, so it was basically just sucking up a lot of time and not really giving us a lot back. What's the right level from the team's point of view? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot this part. How easy was it to write new features? Uh, probably one of the most important ideas uh, behind this talk is like, if you have well-factored code, the time you know it is when you jump into that code to add a new feature and you say, oh wow, I can just take this thing and plug it in here and this thing and plug it in here because it's all modular, right? But if you feel like, oh, I want to grab this thing but it's doing this other thing that I don't want, you know it's not modular, right? And hopefully the tests are sort of encouraging you to sort of break things apart into nice easy pieces. All right, what's the right level from the team's point of view? Also sometimes ignored, right? You get somebody on the team, a couple of people on the team, or a couple of consultants on the team who are big testing zealots. It's really easy to kind of jump in because nobody really wants to raise their hand in this day and age and say like, I think tests suck, you know? Like, there's just not a lot of that going on. So they'll just kind of quietly kind of go along and be like, all right, you know? But if it's a really intense, you know, kind of high maintenance thing, like. For instance, JavaScript testing is kind of the wild west right now. Like, I like Blue Ridge, but there will be times when like env.js does something really weird when trying to simulate the DOM, and you have to spend some time messing around with it, right? Okay, well, we've got a team that can handle that, and we've got some JavaScript guys who could figure that out, but you might not be on that team. So maybe that's not a level of testing that you want to take on. The unit test is king, 
right? If you start with models and controllers and uh, helpers, that's sort of like a really well-trodden path, right? It's really pretty straightforward to sort of get those things to be super reliable and super helpful. So I would say sort of starting easy is a good important thing. Um, there's also this idea of the top-down thing, like what's the level of buy-in for managers? Sometimes you can have managers sort of dictate like, I want a certain test coverage, or I want you know, this level of testing, or I need Selenium. And that can be kind of bad, right? Because if the testing isn't sort of ground up, you can get a lot of backlash and you know, just sort of you know, some bad behaviors from your developers, uh, which we're gonna talk about in a few slides. Um, so what's the right level from the application's point of view? Um, so this is, of course, what is the level of assurance that you need? But if you ask anybody and you take somebody who says, like, I'm gonna take $70,000 of your money. Now, how is important is it for this thing to work? They will say, like, well, really important, right? But they might be proposing something like Twitter, which, you know, Twitter was sort of genius in its way to say, we're gonna just get it out there, and if somebody loses a tweet, they're not gonna die, nothing terrible happens, and then we'll figure out how to make it reliable later, right? It just, they got it out there. It turns out there's an audience, holy crap. Hey, let's uh, work on it some more. Um, because it's easy to lie to yourself about this level of assurance. So make sure you sort of ask why five times. Like, does it really need to work? Really? Are you sure? What bad thing happens? Does people lose money? Does somebody lose their life? Does somebody just have to like type in something into a web form again? Like, you know, different levels. So this is the matrix. Uh, apologies for people in back. It's, uh, it's hard to fit this on here. So this is me summing up all my projects and figuring out uh, what level of testing I had. And if you'll notice, there are nine projects on here, and the word appropriate shows up four times. So this is sort of me saying to you that like, I've spent uh, like you know, five years thinking about the level of testing and learning things, and I've sort of failed more often than I've succeeded. And that's because it's a hard thing to assess, right? There's, there's a lot of ways to lie to yourself. I sometimes get really worried when I talk, up to, talk to startup people, because startup people are all like, well, testing's fine, but phew, you know, like, hey man, like we wanna just get it out there and it slows us down. And, and I feel like they could probably be doing more at the model and controller level than they think they can, right? Because those tests are not particularly hard to write or maintain, but they're in this mentality of like, I gotta get out there, man, like let's not do anything. Keep in mind, at the lowest level of testing that I did, and this was for a startup, I was still doing something like 2.5 test to code ratio that was models and controllers and views, right? I just wasn't doing anything else, and they're not hard to maintain. So try not to, you know, like lying to yourself is pretty easy to do. Um, we need sort of a brutal honesty when assessing like what the level of assurance, what the code quality, what the team buy-in are for these things. All right, lessons learned. Okay, so team is new to testing, ease your way in, right? This is start slow. Uh, selenium water tests, it's, there's, the, I mean, I feel like there's this embarrassment of riches, riches, right? Like with these modern things, it's so easy to get into these and it so, seems so wonderful that you feel like, well, we're stupid if we don't do it. But if you're gonna do this, you really need to commit to doing it. You gotta have a serious machine to run selenium tests. You need to be maybe talking to Sauce Labs about running your tests in the cloud or whatever, paralyzing it because Unit and controller level tests do not take a lot of time and effort to run, but these Selenium and click through and water and click through the app sort of tests, they need a serious machine. And if you have the type of company who's like, hey, can we get another machine? And it's like, yeah, fill out this form in triplicate. Maybe you shouldn't be doing this, right? Like, you know, how, how easy is it to get more resources? Um, yeah, and the other thing is that if you're gonna do integration tests, uh, back to the web unit lessons learned, Sometimes you can do bad things and replace what should be a unit test with an integration level test, right? So you have a test out there that, the typical thing I've seen is like, people will test the controller, but they're really testing the model, right? So they'll be like, oh, if I save this model without a name, then it should like blow up because names are required. That is a model test, that is not a controller test, right? So write the model test, and then if you need an uh, integration test that covers that too, okay but don't ignore the model. The model is uh, much more important to test. Um, so 
this is a lesson that everybody says, the, fat, the test suite has to be fast and reliable, and yet how many people out there have been on a project where you have a slow suite or it's an unreliable suite? It's kind of common, it's an embarrassingly common. Um, and you start noticing these bad things, right? Nobody wants to check in at the end of the day. Like after three o'clock, everybody's like, oh, I guess we'll just check in tomorrow because you don't want to stay late because the build fails. Or you're spending a lot of time on various uh, websites, right? Because you go to check in, you got to wait 20 minutes for a build. And the, the worst part is that the tests are not seen as this awesome putting a wall up that you can put your back against. You know everything behind that wall works. So it's awesome, right? Because you can move on to the next thing. That's what tests give you. They also help you do design. If you're just seeing it as like, oh, there's this impediment here, then that means that you're, you know, like the team is sort of, you know, has to think about what his testing strategy is. Um, and I, I love uh, unreliable test suites. We, we just had that one with our Selenium thing. People just stopped caring about the failing Selenium build. It just, it wasn't important anymore for, to anybody. And then people would go in and just like, oh, uh, like it's supposed to assert that five things come back, but now seven are, so I guess I'll just change it to seven. And you're like, well, <laughs> is it supposed to be seven? I don't know, it works now. <laughs> um, so slow test suite, fix it, right? There's ways to fix this. You can parallelize it. There's a thing called parallel spec that's pretty cool. Um, run it on a fast machine or in the cloud. This is a fight to have early and often with management is to say, we have a problem. This thing does not run fast enough. Give us a bigger machine. Um, external services are the devil. Um, please don't hit them in unit tests. Uh, profile your suite and examine slow tests. A lot of times just somebody's just doing something dumb. Like I saw something where somebody created 35 objects because something happened when you've made more than 34. So they would like put in a before filter like they created these 35 objects, but really only one test needed it and there was like 50 tests there. But because it was in a before thing, it, got happen, it happened every time, right? So that's a lot of objects to create, um, especially if they're active record objects. Um, yeah, you know, because uh, Factory Girl is a great thing, right? But Factory Girl makes it really easy to spool up a ton of active record objects. Um, remove redundant tests, important. Um, so yeah, we're about wrapping up here. I think this is the uh, last slide, yeah. So I can take questions now. Questions for me. Yes. Um, how do you give any recommendations on um, implementing a sort of TDD culture on a project where there are no current tests and it's very important that the project be well tested, i.e. help IT? <laughs> so how do you implement a TDD culture um, when it's very important to test? Um, it's, it's kind of a thing of like, striking at the low-hanging fruit uh, will get people into it. So like something that's purely algorithmic, like one of the best, some of the best fun I've had testing is when you're testing, like I had to figure out if a point was inside a polygon not so long ago. And that's just a joy to test because there's nothing outside, right? You have a point and you have a polygon and you just like start like, you know, testing to see if it thinks it's inside or you think it's outside. And then the great thing about that is that just, you know, is something that is very self-contained and people can say, oh, cool, now I know that this works. I've tried all possible weird ball cases. So now I can move on and do something with the point inside a polygon. Um, so like the things where you have to integrate with other things and there's all sorts of variables and you have to like do mocking, that's, you know, kind of intense. Um, maybe you're going to hold off with uh, mocking and stubbing for a little while and sort of focus on some core stuff and get people enthused about that. Because if you throw in mocking and stubbing right away, um, that's, it can be kind of a burden, right? Because I, I know when I first started doing mocking and stubbing, I totally thought I got it. And then like I looked back at it a year later and went, oh my gosh, I, I like just did, should receive an expectation on it everywhere when I really wanted stubs, right? But when to stub and when to mock is kind of a mature testing level decision that you have to kind of you know, learn over the course of a, a long time. Yes, and back. Is there a metric foo on something other than GitHub for the gems? Yeah, that's a, it's a good idea. Um, the, question, the question was, am I going to put metric foo on something else besides GitHub? So I've been really busy for a couple of months, and apparently there's this thing called Gem Cutter now. And uh, <laughs> I actually ran into Nick Corino. Is he somewhere here? Um, yeah, so 
we, uh, we shared a shuttle here, and I was like talking to him, and then I realized, like, oh my gosh, he's a contributor to Metric Foo, which is awesome. And then he was talking about Gem Cutter, and I was like, kind of sad and embarrassed, like, oh man, I, I probably should do that. So yes, that's on the list of things to do. I'm trying to get this project out the door, so. Yes? Your JavaScript tests, are you, are, are, you, are you happy with them? Are you finding they are catching bugs and driving your JavaScript design? So the question is, are we happy with our JavaScript tests? Um, and the answer is not as much as the unit tests. Um, it's, I like it versus no tests because I've been on projects where you have like really complex uh, interactions on a page and it's all just like, like either in the page, in the HTML itself, which is horrible, or it's just this you know, super long JS file that you have no idea what any of this stuff does. So I like the sort of self-documentation of the tests. I like... Um, that uh, you know, I can actually like have a reasonable expectation of what's going to happen, but it's it's still kind of a work in progress. I still feel like it's coming along. They're not as reliable. Sometimes they'll just fail randomly, and like you just run it again, and they pass. Um, it's it's not as mature, so I, it's getting there. Like a couple of years, like two years ago, I tried to do JavaScript unit testing, and it just wasn't there, and I had to give up. So better than before, getting better every day. Yes. I wish you know that. So, because I started out with Blue Ridge and kind of gave up on it because it uses Rhino and it is slow. Um, and so I put together a bunch of stuff. It's very Blue Ridge like. So it, um, it uses the Johnson port, which is Ruby and Spider Monkey and things like that. So, if anybody's interested in, because in, JavaScript, once I started being able to test it better, um, I was a lot more happy with So, if people are interested in it, there's stuff on me on, on GitHub, like, and just Look for well. I, it's called, I call it Jazz RB, and we can go from there. But if there are other people, it's real early. But I use it for production level JavaScript writing. So I'm interested in any and all experiences related to that. So, so the comment was uh, you'd been frustrated uh, with Blue Ridge, so you created Jazz RB, J A Z R B. Right, because it's based on Jasmine instead of Screw Unit. Because Screw Unit is kind of this thing that is Screw Unit when it fails. Like the stack trace is all screw unit, and it can be hard to figure out like where was your problem. And it's also, I mean, it's just it's not a it's a very sort of chaotic project as well. There's not a whole lot. There's a million forks of it and things like that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, I mean, those are all all these things. I mean, I made so there's the JSRB stuff runs against Jasmine, which is like screw unit, but it has a, a, a an auto test like interface so that I can just save my files and retest them. Huh. So and I work very heavily on the MJS stuff too, so I'm a big contributor on there. So. Is that just Z? Is that Z? J A Z because I didn't want to type Jasmine every single time. R B and it's not Jasmine specific. I actually added Q unit to it. It's just I picked the name very quickly. Cool. Yes. Uh, just, just a comment. We're talking about JavaScript testing. What we found is that 90% of the failures in our apps are having to do with JavaScript. <laughs> we use jQuery is that the DOM structure of the view changed and no, the jQuery behavior was no longer being attached. Here we are with the class or IDs uh, being modified. So if you add view spec or integration uh, level assertions to say that a particular uh, you know, class is present, that looks, that's where your uh, jQuery behavior hooks into it. I think that's an appropriate trade off where you're not necessarily testing your JavaScript, but you're testing that the hooks. So good comment. The, the idea is that uh, when you're testing uh, JavaScript, a lot of times you're testing against like a stub something that has an ID in it, but maybe your designer later comes along and changes the ID or the class, and now your J unit can't attach to that, right? So you you could do a ver you know a view unit a view test or a integration test that ass asserts that the things that you think are in your uh, DOM are actually in your DOM. Comment on that, Dr. Nick's uh, fork of um, Blue Ridge has something where you can generate the your your, your fixture um, uh, from from your code from your actual view. <coughs> so you would uh, avoid that problem. So I, I was writing something like that. Then Dr. Nick said he'd already done it. So, so there apparently there's a fork of Blue Ridge that uh, creates the uh, the stub from uh, not not really a stub. It's actually from your actual. Uh, uh, from your actual uh, view. Now, does that work with Hamel, or is that? Yeah, it uses um, it uses our spec view of our spec view test to generate it. Huh. Hard to, hard to. Cool. Yes. So 
So control interfaces tend to be more stable because they're publicly facing, whereas model interface is internal to your application, as uh, there is no breakaway need to feedback or stability. So given that, uh, why would you prefer to do model tests if controller tests will uh, test a more stable interface or which is less likely to um, so the question is, why should I test models uh, in, uh, instead of testing models through the controllers if the controller is more of a public API and it's going to be more stable where the models could change more often? Um, and one of the short, the short answer is math. That like, if I'm testing a controller, there's a certain amount of paths through a controller, right? So, so I have an index action. Maybe there's five paths through it, right? I got to test five paths. But now if that index is interacting with three or four objects, how many paths are there through that object, right? So now I have to do, okay, five times, I don't know, something times something, and I have now, like, I should write like 100 tests maybe for this one index, and most people just don't do that, right? Like, you, it's very hard to exhaustively test the pass through something when you're doing what, um, you know, is sort of a, you know, a, a two, not purely a unit, right, where you're combining a couple of things, sort of you're testing a locus of things that interact together. Um, it could be very robust, right, if you're willing to do it because now all you're doing is basically saying that, like, I want this behavior out of the controller and then you're free to do whatever you want to your models as long as they behave the same way. But it can be uh, very rough to make sure that you have uh, extensive testing through it. Yes? With your Selenium test, had you tried using, uh, or was it even available, like, Cucumber and the stories to make a DSL above your low-level code. So did we try Cucumber? No, we did not. We started out with uh, Polonium, because uh, we had a Pivotal guy on it, and he liked uh, Polonium. And then later we moved to WebRat. Um, we have not used Cucumber. Um, the problem was never really writing them. Writing them wasn't too hard. It was The problem was getting them to run consistently. Yes, over here. I don't use Cucumber. Yes. Uh, can you just comment on how to write successfully that allows you to easily keep refactoring your code? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question is, how, how do you write a test suite that allows you to refactor your code? That's the hard problem, right? I mean, like, really, testing is supposed to be about design, and you just keep iterating on it. You keep going, like, are the tests helping me, or are they hurting me? Is this thing, like, brittle and getting in my way, or is this forcing me to start thinking harder about my models and like, wait, do I have too much going on in here? Do I have too little going on here? Should I put two models together? And that's object oriented, right? You have to know objects in order to figure that out. Uh, the best thing the test can do is help you start asking those questions. I have to wrap up because we're, uh, we're after two o'clock here, but if you want to track me down in the hallway, feel free. Uh, thank you very much for coming to the talk.